<laughs> Hi. Okay. So we're officially starting our webinar. I'm, I'm so excited. I mean, every week I'm excited, but I'm very excited this week because we were, we invited some of our friends that we thought would represent different parts of the world. And I wanted to talk about healthy habits and routines because for me, this is, a core of our profession of occupational therapy and instilling healthy habits and routines um, so that our children and families can engage in occupations and co-occupations that are meaningful but also promote health. Um, so, you know, thinking about that also during quarantine, I know my own quarantine <laughs> experience the first day was like, whoo! I'm on vacation, I'm gonna sleep, I ate snacks, and then like within a couple of days, I was like, whoa, uh, you've got to get some discipline because <laughs> this isn't gonna be healthy if you do this kind of behavior for the long, long run. And then also we started the virtual sessions with our families and the family routines were disrupted and everybody sort of had to reevaluate how they were doing our life, uh, doing their lives. And, and I thought, you know, well, we don't all do it the same way. There's not one way to do this. And I know um, I'm very interested to hear how you guys all do this. We have been very privileged to create these friendships with all of you and others around the world um, in different parts of the uh, globe and seeing different um, ways of living, schedules, uh, I'm, I'm interested. I know yesterday I found out a new tidbit, Sultan. You were saying you get up at three in the morning to have breakfast during Ramadan. That startles me. Um, I get up at three in the morning because I'm stressing out about something. <laughs> Rarely for breakfast. <laughs> Sorry. But anyway, so I just want to introduce our guest. Um, Dr. Sultan Alfawaz is from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and he has spent the last 10 years in working in the United States. So you've gotten immersed in our US culture, but of course you're back in Saudi. Um, Isabel, who will join us shortly, is Dr. Isabel Baudry, is an occupational therapist originally from Canada. She is now living in Spain. She's raised her family in Spain um, and she's uh, quite well versed. She travels frequently also. She's done some amazing research. I hope that she'll be able to join us with the internet. And then we have Rand Cook, who's a dear friend from South Africa. And you know, when I, when I wanted to invite you, I have always in my mind this balance of work and play because you are a very, very hard worker. You have a clinic, but you always infuse play in all of your interactions with everybody, including your families. And then Katya, um, it, of course we love Katya. <laughs> um, but Katia is an occupational therapist in Brazil and you trained in Australia. So you have a little bit of a taste of that culture and with ties to the Netherlands, right? So uh, you also have, you know, and you have a practice and you have two small children, very small children. And of course we have Marco Liao who's, you know, joins us also with two small children. And, and of course my, wonderful partner Zoe and Classy. So, um, and then Isabel. Hi, Isabel. Can you hear Hello. us? And are you really here? Okay, I, I just gave a little bit of a taste of who you guys are and where you're from, but I'm wondering if you want to tell us a little bit more um, about your background. Maybe, maybe, maybe we start with Isabel because I'm afraid we might lose you again. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit Hi, more well, about yourself? Thank you for, for having me. Um, well, I'm, I'm from Canada. I uh, really fell in love with uh, my profession from day one. I uh, wasn't too sure what to do with my life, but once I discovered OT, I was just totally hooked and, and was very lucky to have some great professors. And then I've just been blessed with all the people that I've met along my journey and have accompanied me um, in this 
this journey that that is my career and 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 exploring and researching and helping families uh, with uh, difficulties with their kids with eating pooping <laughs> mainly is what I've dedicated my my career to. Thanks. Okay, Sultan, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your yourself? You're, you're muted. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm Saudi Arabian uh, occupational therapist. I was one of the first Saudi Arabian who were trained in occupational therapy. Uh, um, that's why our government sent us to UK. Uh, I got my bachelor at Brunel University in West London. And I practiced in Saudi Arabia for three years. And then I stalked Miss Zoe Mayo and Suzanne smith Rowley, and I looked for <laughs> that. And then I moved to California, Torrance. Um, uh, I moved to California, Los Angeles, and I uh, pursued my master in clinical doctorate um, at the uh, University of Southern California. I've been living in Southern California for over almost 10 years. Um, I'm a permanent resident in the U.S. Um, and at the same time, um, I've been a visiting consultant and a junket professor with Al Faisal University. Uh, we offered classic courses in Riyadh um, for the first time, and I've just taken a new position um, to establish the OT department at the Autism Center of Excellency in Riyadh, which is a newly established autism center. Uh, funded by all banks of Saudi Arabia, uh, the 11 banks of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. and, and we have a huge fund to make it one of the leading uh, autism center in Saudi Arabia. So I'm excited for this opportunity, which uh, surprisingly uh, come across during this pandemic. Uh, I'm almost finishing month two um, and looking forward for um, more uh, months to come. Nice. Rayan, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? You said it. I play and I love OT. <laughs> <laughs> I think luckily I went in the right profession and luckily I can play with children. So I've been involved in schools um, and in private practice. I'm a clinician. I'm not the academic. I'm the clinician. Although I do head up SAECES, which is our South African Institute for those of you who came to, to our international congress. I do head up the education side, despite being a total clinician. Mm -hmm. And more than that, I just love the family and the kids. And I've got to practice on a farm, which is up my alley because I come from a farm. So yeah, yeah I'm just a play therapist. I and like Isabel, I like Isabel, Isabel you, you have two grown sons. Isabel also has two grown sons, about in the same age range. Mm -hmm. Yes. They're all quite naughty, eh? And now with lockdown, <laughs> the cousins also moved in. So it's been grown, grown children, yeah, but we've, and we barbecue every night when they were in lockdown. Nice. And, and Katya? Yes, um, I've studied uh, OT in Brazil. First I went to Australia and then I, I helped there at the Olympics, Paralympics in 2000 and then I said, that, well, I need to work with disabled people. That's what I want to do. So I came back to Brazil. I did my OT here and then went back to, I went to Netherlands and then Australia to do my master's there in clinical rehabilitation. And then when I came back, worked, worked there a little bit and I came back to Brazil and then I did the course with Suzanne and Zoe for sense integration. That's when I fell in love for this area and uh, since then, um, after the, the first year here in Brazil, 2013, I, I started translating the, all the courses for, for Classy, for Sense Integration. And so I have, I own now a, cl a private clinic and I have a horse riding therapy center and I do the translations for the courses at, at, for Gene Sense. Nice, nice. Well, welcome and, uh, everybody. And yeah, and two little girls. So. <laughs> and that's the, the biggest part of the, the job nowadays is that my two little girls. <laughs> yeah, and they're amazing. They're so cute. Well, we, we think they're pretty amazing, but of course, 
the children of OTs are amazing, but all children are amazing. <laughs> yeah. and, and Katya, you didn't mention the flower business. I see your beautiful flowers behind you. Uh, since you're also yeah. on a farm, maybe Rayanne would relate to that. Uh, would uh, like would, to hear yeah. a little bit more about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also live on a farm. We produce eggs, hay, and flowers. These flowers are not from us, oh. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> they're very they're pretty beautiful. too. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what I love doing now. now the, the best part of the craft quarantine now is to go horse riding um, with a car with the, with the two little girls. So that's really good to live on a farm now <laughs> for yeah. during the quarantine. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, and I just thought we should also acknowledge the the amazing array of countries who have, from people who have joined us from around the world. We have so many different parts of the world joining. It's always great every week when we have people from from so many different places, but this week especially since it's a kind of an international celebration. So yeah, I, I, and I also heard from people that they were happy that we changed the time because usually we do it at 5 p.m., but then it's middle of the night for many people. So hopefully this allows a few more people to join us live. Yeah. Well, welcome, everybody. So, Zoe, I, you know, if you could get us started on our on sure. our. Track. Well, as we were thinking about this topic, I, I was reflecting on my uh, very fortunate opportunities to spend time with all of you in the beautiful places in the world in which you live. And I was just thinking about, you know, the daily, one of the things I love about coming to see all of you is that we really get to see how people live. We don't come as a tourist and go to touristy places. We come to your homes and, and go pick up groceries and pick up your children and and it's such a special way to get to experience the world. I was wondering if each of you might just chat a little bit about some of the quintessential elements that you think are part of the culture where you live. Because I could think about, I was at course, you know, not surprisingly, thinking sensorily about the sense and the, the feel of the sun or some of the, the streets that we walk on and those experiences that we have that are so ingrained in your days. So I just wondered if each of you might share a little bit about some of the things that you think are particular or special to the habits and routines of the lives where you live. Maybe we'll start with Isabel. Sure. Um, I've been living in Spain now for, for 20 years and uh, it's really my home. <laughs> I, I really feel completely at ease and at home in, in Spain. And one of the things that I really love about it is, is the, you know, the, the paseo, <laughs> the going on a walk with really nothing special to do or to go, but you just go <laughs> and you go out and families go out together and the parks where children play are, are always full and this community of families that you know share these spaces and 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 i'm lucky enough to live in in a relatively small city oviedo where it's it's you know every day you have this routine of of accompanying your children to school or you know seeing other families going to the park having uh, the children often have their snacks outside um, and they have these really nice, healthy, <laughs> fresh fruit kind of snacks. And I, I like to see that, you know, and I think it's something that um, some, you know, some of the periods that I've, I've been in the United States for, for my master's, for example, in Virginia, this going on a walk with nowhere in mind, I couldn't do that in Virginia. It was like, <laughs> people are <laughs> slowing down their car while I'm walking on the side. And makes me feel very uncomfortable and realize how that, you know, just it's, it's not, not it, it's, it's, it's really ingrained in the, in the Spanish culture and I've, it's really become part of me. <laughs> I'm so glad you're talking about that. I just have to mention Marco. I don't know if you remember Marco, but we were in Portugal on a Sunday walking along the beach and I said, 
what's going on, Marco? What, why are they walking so slowly? <laughs> and he, it was so unusual to me. I'd never seen people walk that slowly. And, then, and I said, it's Sunday. <laughs> and they said like something like that. It's like They're strolling. And it was, it really like woke me up because I just thought I've never seen this. I've never seen people walk this way. <laughs> but <laughs> in the pandemic, we in the U.S. will have a little more appreciation for slowing down and walking. I have to say that you walk, you walk really fast, Zoe, for your uh, small legs. You walk really fast. I cannot join you on a walk. You were just... <laughs> yeah, I guess I've heard that before. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay so yeah, well I, thank you Isabel um I, I didn't mean to cut you off I just that really struck me was there no no that's mm -hmm. fine <laughs> so um, I, I, I mean just for me as a as a mother here uh raising my my children in a in a relatively small Spanish city it has been just precious to to have them come home for lunch walk to school develop this, you know, in their pre-adolescence and adolescence, de mm -hmm. develop the a gradual sense of autonomy, you know, first going to the school, then going to the other corner, then going to your friend's house, then, then just moving about in this strolling kind of way in a very natural progression, which I think is, I, I feel very fortunate to be part of because it, it is kind of a a nice way to grow up mm -hmm. and grow into, um, you know, gradually into more complex occupations, mm -hmm. complex uh, environments, but in a very gradual and friendly way. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering before you finish uh, this portion, if you might talk a little bit about the time frame in Spain. I, I think to me, it <laughs> seems like Spain has maybe one of the most unique, um, timing of, the, of their days and if any of that is changed or more exaggerated with the pandemic or just you know how that compares to other places you've lived that seems so unique well well i mean it is the, the thing that for people from outside that is always kind of the first thing to you know when my my family comes here you know like when's dinner <laughs> you know and it's like six in the afternoon no no it's snack time it's tea time it's not it's not dinner <laughs> um uh, but and you know this children will you will usually have their dinner you know around 8 30 9 go to bed around 9 30 10 and school starts a little later than it does usually in north america and, and it's just a little bit off, everything's a little off, an hour and a half or two hours off the, the um, schedules that we usually do in North America. But it's, <laughs> you get used to it. <laughs> and is there really a siesta in the middle of the day? Oh, ojalá. <laughs> uh, I wish. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. It's kind of being a little uh, abandoned. It's still people... There is, there is still a nice big break in the middle of the day in most um, businesses. Um, you know, if you try to go to a store at 2 or 3 or 3.30 in the afternoon, everything is closed. So people might not actually sleep, but there is still that tradition of, you know, having a nice long break. If you're lucky enough to be able to go home, you know, a little... A little snooze <laughs> is still part of many people's habits, which I think is is wonderful. I wonder if that kind of schedule will allow in a way for more spreading out of work and you know as we as people return to school and to offices, if it might more naturally work out for things to be spaced out since people are already used to a a late day. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it, it definitely contributes to that, you know, because we have the, 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 the more um, like civil servant kind of schedule, or they'll do more like a, a, a continuous uh, work schedule from a little earlier on in the morning until the, the big lunch break, and then in the afternoon they're off. And then you have people who work more in the commercial kind of, you know, world like stores and 
clinics <laughs> where we split our day in half, where we have like really the morning and the afternoon portion. So um, I think it does kind of spread the, the, the work around and, and the people around. And it's not like everybody from nine to five or everybody from eight to four. So I think that Ooh, can yeah. actually be a good thing. Great. Uh, so shall we move on? Let's see, shall we go on to Sultan? Sultan, uh, so many interesting things about the <laughs> routines and culture. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where you'll even begin. Uh, it was really an experience to come to Saudi Arabia and even just to see how your family lives. It was so amazing, the closeness Ready, of family. the extended I think family. for you, Zoe and Suzanne, seeing just... <laughs> Um, how family get together, you know, during the week, like all my sister who are married will come to home and see my mom three times a week to four times a week. So it's part of the family dynamic uh, for daughters and sons to come and sit for the tea time. Tea time is very, very, or tea coffee time, which is around literally after sunset. Around so, so Sultan, time. before you go too far, I want people to, uh, to really be able to picture this. So do you mind just telling them just a little bit about how big your family is so they can really picture oh. what you're talking about? <laughs> I've been fortunate to have a, a huge family. Um, uh, my dad didn't have any brother or sisters. Um, and at, at that time in the 70s when Saudi became more uh, as a modernized uh, society and the country has been, you know, going through all this social revolution of men and women going to school and everything. Government were supporting a lot of women to go to work and supporting families and having more kids. So I'm lucky to say that I have many brother and sister, let's put it this way, over five. Um, um, and, um, uh, we and we are. I, I, I always say I'm uh, being very, very fortunate that although we, I come from a big family, right? My mom, even my mom, has a big family as well. Um, but what I always miss because I spent most half of my life almost uh, abroad, I always miss the the family gathering around around sunset where we drink the tea and have the coffee and have little sweet and just talk about that we have done during the day. Uh, and we call it the uh, Maghrib time, which is the sunset time. And I, I'm sure it's not only embedded within the Saudi culture. I think it's a more, um, a more Middle Eastern culture. Like there are a lot of similarity between the Spanish and uh, the Arabic culture because of the Moors and everything. So in Siesta, it's still, it may be faded a little bit, with um, westernization that's happening in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia where work schedule has changed to be nine to five rather than, you know, um, eight to 12 and then four to eight. Um, but it's still, as when you say, Isabel, about tea time, tea time is really, really, really important. Like in the US, I've been living for 10 years. I, I wouldn't drink a coffee at the, uh, at six o'clock. We don't usually drink coffee at six o'clock. Uh, yeah. But when I come back to Saudi, I would drink tea and coffee nonstop. Whenever oh. anybody can come. And I remember like Zoe and Suzanne have visited my house and usually after we do the course, like <laughs> 7, 8 p.m. and we'll offer them tea and coffee. <laughs> so it's, 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 you see all these <laughs> uh, differences. Um, and I'm sure in other cultures we'll have alternatives, right? But, where you may have alternatives like having uh, some drinks or um, uh, accept drink within your culture like wine or anything, but you will have some like some sort of a drink that brings the family all together and brings the loved one all together. And for my culture, tea and coffee and dates are really, really important, especially during the sunset time. And I think I've been very, very fortunate living abroad and living in Saudi Arabia and seeing um, all these differences. And um, although, as I said earlier, I've been traveling to many countries and living in the U.S. for 10 years and U.K. for four years, still the migrant time and the sunset time is very, very uh, valuable for me. And I will never, never 
uh, fade it or um, change that uh, routine of me. But it's really, really uh, situational. Like I really, really miss it here. But when I'm there, I, I can't have it by myself or something, you know, because you're not going to meet someone who really want to drink a coffee with you at 7 p.m. <laughs> in California, yeah. uh, especially if we're going to go to bed by 10 or, uh, or 9. That's, if, if I can talk now, yes. that's, <laughs> that's something uh, that Sultan said that really, it's really good is, uh, to, live, to be able to live abroad and to be able to see the different mm. cultures. And, and then you can also um, uh, give a, the right value to what, you, mm. what you've been doing with your family for that, that many years. And then when you are overseas, you say, oh, they don't do this over here. How important that, that routine, that habit. Uh, of being with the family, having barbecues with the family and things like that is so, um, so important to us. So, uh, and I think here in Brazil, this, um, we are very, very social people. So we like having families and you, you can go to someone's house, I think, knock on the door and say, well, uh, it's lunchtime. And, and the people say, oh, we have enough food, come in. And we always have space for some, someone else. And, um, so, and, and I think that's the, the biggest thing about the Brazilian culture. We'll come in and join us and eat with us and let's have a barbecue and, and sports are really uh, huge here too. So it's a good get, getting together and um, just uh, the, the, the biggest one of the problems, I think uh, that we, we don't have that the joint, uh, the hours that we work is, is a lot. We don't have, we don't work from nine to five, for example. Um, so we have to work a lot more than that. But yeah. What, and I what, guess, is, what is a huh? typical work day, Katya, maybe? A typical work day? I would say from eight to, to seven, something like that. In, in bigger cities like Sao Paulo, they even go worse than that because then they oh, longer. have time yeah oh. longer lo longer yeah. hours yeah. in smaller cities are better and bigger cities are worse I, I i notice yeah well you might have some similarities with rayanne in south africa i mm -hmm. think because of the dutch influence yeah. I, I think we have a bit of everyone yeah yeah you have more we, we're known as a rainbow nation so you've got the the European influence we've got, we've got our real farmers influence. And then we, it's actually interesting because I mean, on, in the way we live, we were the English people in the Afrikaans area. So I was brought up in a very much a farmer type lifestyle of our Afrikaans person, yet we were the English people. And then you had all the people on the farm with you. So I, I think we, I think we're so diverse that there's actually I can't say which way. I mean, if I look at Isabella, what you're saying about that going nowhere slowly, we are, it's one of our sayings here. And we talk about <laughs> African time, which means that's another time, you know? If, it, if you're supposed to be there at 10 o'clock, well, you can arrive at 12 o'clock and that's still fine. And then yet another part of South Africa says, if it's six o'clock, you're there at quarter to six. So we've, we've got this actually diversity, but yet I think in each diversity, of, so we've got, I think we've got our different ethnic groups, and then we've got a different, your affluent group in your very under-resourced area. And then, you, I mean, with our nine languages, it's just, it's fun, by the way. It's, 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 <laughs> and I think the big thing is you actually really, we have to understand each other culture. But there are similarities. I mean, I think about, off the cuff, our similarities would be that we are very social people. So whether you are, we do a lot of visiting at our houses and that. So no matter what, race you are we all social i think our social life is actually very active like outdoor physical so i think lockdown for us is a, is a hard one because we're not used to i don't think we're that much of a virtual country yet on the virtual mm -hmm. platform it's all having I mean, to learn it but it's it's interesting and we and each culture has their really they sit in not there they've got their traditions that's mm -hmm. yeah i mean i look at our family which is 10, 11 generations on the one side and five on the other. So we're really deeply rooted. And you've got all those traditions of just those two families. And then you've got all the other nine or 10 or 11, 12, whatever, whatever we've got here. But it's, uh, and I think South Africa's got one thing is we, 
they are, we, we call it Ubuntu, which is I am because we are. So despite being, having our differences, and we have a lot of differences, we are one. We're not a perfect country, that I can tell you. But no country, I think, is perfect. I think what, ha what we have learned from this pandemic is the importance of social connection. Yeah. Mm. It's it just, you know, you cannot, I cannot capitalize on this. Like, you do, I, I miss, like in Saudi Arabia, we have, uh, you know, a partial curfew. It starts from 5 p.m. Mm. and we have um, a complete curfew as well. Before, thank God, now we are in the partial curfew. And just the, just the fact that many of us couldn't have that connection and meeting together and mm. seeing my sisters used to come with their kids three times a week. Um, my mom would visit her mom like every week at least once and missing all these little bit has affected all of us and it just uh, made us more value more our connection and um, our, um, our uh, time together uh, sharing our, you know, even sharing our little differences between the family. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, being able to sit together and talk about um, uh, our work. Everyone comes with different background and we sit on the table uh, and talk about our clients. And, you know, I come from a family who were like a lot of us in the medical field. My sister is mm -hmm. dentist, my other sister is a speech therapist. Uh, I have a clinical dietitian and a medical technologist. And it would be fun, like, some, in the Maghreb time where we would sit together, we we'll all talk about our clients, our worker, and we'll see the differences. Mm -hmm. And we learn from each other, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but during this pandemic, although we do a lot of Zooms, but uh, man, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. But Sultan, what is quite difficult is, in, in a lot of the areas, they haven't actually got um, access to the internet. Yeah. So the feeling now is, um, so in some areas we can, in other areas we can't. So it's, so I think the lockdown is hard on some people, but it's, it does, it draws people together. We have to work through this together. And it is nice to see what different countries do, because there's always a small thing you can learn from another country that might actually work in your country that you didn't think about. You know, you're talking about healthy habits. Uh, there is a lot of, um, one of the healthy habits, a lot of, um, a lot of people do and more like um, older men will do in Saudi Arabia is by sunrise they will go like in two or three and walk around the neighborhood you know and when um, and when it's come like around May June July because you know Saudi gets uh, gets hot. most of the area in Saudi gets really really hot mm -hmm. people will go and this is this habit has started early 90s where people will go and stroll in the malls they will just go to the malls, they will have a coffee or something and just walk. They're not going to shop. They don't usually shop. They'll just go to the malls and just walk around. And even this habit, because all the malls now are closed, people don't do it. And during this time is Ramadan, which is very, very social time. Ramadan, the, the holy month of Ramadan is all about social. And one of the habits we always do is share food. So before the day, before we break fast, which is sunset time, like you will see people will share food with each other within the same neighborhood. But because of COVID-19, we've been very, very restricted mm. on sharing food. And just this little element of sharing food has mm. affected people. So what that people now are doing is ordering food for their neighbors or for yeah. their family. Mm. Mm -hmm. But the beauty before was more like you are eating like more home food, homemade food. So this has been affected by COVID-19, but hopefully this is only a temporary uh, situation. Hopefully, I'm a big believer that it's gonna make us stronger. Mm. I don't know if, uh, if any of you've seen the question in the chat box, but someone asked, could you speak to the role of routines on the development of language, social, emotional, and motor skills in early childhood? That's a big topic, but I wondered maybe some of you just have some observations from your own uh, areas and cultures about how you believe things in your culture might have been affecting early development. Well, maybe I can speak to that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Now, Isabella, go. Now, you go, Isabella. Um, one of the things that uh, happens in many uh, cities and even smaller cities uh, in Spain is that most people live in like condominiums, 
apartment mm -hmm. buildings and not very many people have a house with a garden. So when this confinement came about, it's really you're confined to an apartment, which has made a, a big mm -hmm. difference, um, you know, for the, few, the, the the few families who do have gardens or you're muted Isabel there thank you there so I think that that has definitely uh, been a factor in in because I think I, I was watching you know some of Annie Maury's uh, uh, videos that she was doing during the pandemic and children were could actually you know, go out on the sidewalk, see another child, a neighbor, keep their distances, but they could st still, in some sense, do this uh, socialization. Whereas in, in Spain, many families have actually been, you know, eight weeks without getting their children outside, which is, mm -hmm. I think, definitely, it's, you know, <laughs> we'll have to see how things go, but, but the impact on, on socialization, on language, on, on, on sensory motor, it, we, we, we tried to support our families as much as we could with all kinds of ideas for the, inside the mm -hmm. home, but there comes a time where, <laughs> you know, kids <laughs> need to rush. So this, this living in apartments, uh, this style mm -hmm. of, of housing in, in Spain, I think has definitely been something to take into consideration in the development of children, and especially within this pandemic situation. Well, one of the things that we know is that we've had to have resiliency to understand how to adapt to the quarantine, the new lifestyle. And a big concern I have are the families that have less resources, whatever mm -hmm. those resources are, emotional, mm -hmm. physical, spiritual, mm -hmm. you know, geographic. I think uh, Pratia and Rayan, you were talking about that a little bit earlier before we started the webinar. And, and then when you have children who don't conform to the routines in, in the good times, that they're not falling into step by, you know, getting up and getting their bath and whatever those routines are that you, that I think give a sense of order and mm -hmm. self-regulation to the day. So, you know, you, you guys are all practicing uh, occupational therapists. What are your recommendations for families that are struggling to find those healthy, um, you, you know, routines, habits that, that we've all talked about so far. Um, my sense is that if I can, I find now with a few, some of the clients now, I think one of the first things I do with the teletherapy is actually get video footage of the house and who they're staying with, because often they've had to move in with granny or something. And the whole, I mean, yeah we have meltdowns like anything and i think the first thing i go for is actually back to vi old-fashioned visual organizers routine mm -hmm. in that house and i said and i actually worked through the one to make the organizer that suits that child and all physical it's all when you take it off when you use a big and i was actually surprised that that was one of my most my main things in the end i even worked at, made up a powerpoint so when i speak to the parents i've actually got a powerpoint just to to try and work out exactly what's going to work for that child. Or like a schedule, like a visual schedule, yeah, it's, it's, you call yeah, it here. It's a visual schedule, yeah. a schedule, but you've got to make it so specific mm -hmm. to each child. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, f I found, I must say, in the end, they gave a few things that worked out. One was the get up routine was in the, in the, in the bedroom or the kit in the bathroom. And I even, Isabella, you would like, I did have a poop routine for one child also in the, in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and it's interesting what you've got to use for regulation. To suddenly find the dog on the trampoline to be the answer. Mm -hmm. You actually mm -hmm. have play with a specific dog on the trampoline because that's the only thing that regulates this child. But you really, I went back to that old fashioned, you know, the OT time chart from morning mm -hmm. to evening. And I think and again, can, hmm? sorry, sorry, you can Go finish ahead. your sentence. No, I was finished, yeah. Yeah. I guess uh, uh, having a routine is really important, like don't sleep in, just wake up at the, the time that you normally wake up and then get dressed and, and do all the routine that you need to be doing, normally you would be doing, like you would take your kids to school, you're not taking the, skid, the kids to school, but a lot of kids are doing online school now, so they need to get up, they need to get dressed, maybe they, they want to put the uniform 
on if they want if if mm -hmm. it's part if it's important for the child so so they understand okay this is school time now and and so it's important to keep those times so time to 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 have lunch time to to uh um have dinner, have a bath, and follow these routines like you would normally do, not be in the, doing this pandemic. Um, and then also uh, taking a, a, a little bit of, uh, um, following a little bit what Rayan was saying. Um, uh, also like doing a video from the house is important and, and asking the children doing this uh, tele, um, oh, I forgot the word. The tele -hub. Word they'll have you should uh okay what do you have in your house show me what you can use i have here a pillow that i can jump on top of this pillow what do you have in your house i think even the less uh, uh the people that don't have enough um uh things in the house or many opportunities you can still create something with them together with them and i think this is really important to create with them um some circuits or things that they can do or somehow they can spin or some movement that's really important for for them at this moment that they're not getting that enough, that normally won't won't get enough uh, movement but now it's even worse yeah i think that that predictability of the routine uh, gives a sense of safety for children as long as it doesn't have rigidity also, I mean, you, you know, yeah. there has to be flexibility mm -hmm. built in there as well, because some of the children are like, why do I need to put my uniform on? I'm not going to school. Okay, yeah. well, all right, today we have pajama day. But but I do think that uh, I, I like what you were saying, because also pairing some of the activities of daily living with the expected activities. Okay, mm -hmm. well, here you get dressed because you do this. And now you come, you get up here because we do this. Mm -hmm. I would love to share something. Um, before I share this, I want to just um, stress about the importance of sleep hygiene for kids mm -hmm. and their development. That's we, so I cannot stress, even in the clinic, whenever I see any child coming to my clinic crying, the first things I would ask mom, is he sick? Did he sleep? Is he sick? Did he sleep well? Is he hungry? Because these are really, really important. Mm -hmm the child development. I mean, I think everyone knows that, but we know, sometimes you forget about the importance for all these children, especially if they are younger, even teens as well, just to sleep and have good solid eight hours of sleep. I think this is really, really, really important. The other thing, what I have been doing with my nep nephews and nieces, as I always say, <laughs> you know, I have a, bit, a huge family and I actually, because, you know, I'm the uncle and maybe, you know, um, uh, they, they call me the, uh, the, the American uncle and they all love me because, you know, whenever I come back or bring all these Amazon gifts and everything. So I actually say to them and I've been saying to some of my clients as well as now it's you are as a parent staying at home more and the kids are staying at home more. Maybe they are bored from doing all these video games, iPad and everything. I've been encouraging them a lot to go in the kitchen and try to try different recipes and you would be surprised i have put like um, some little treat and prizes who's gonna learn five recipes and um within my own family but at the same time even like teaching the kids about the sequences sequencing and you doing all these little treat and um little treat for your family by doing little cookies and sharing and just learning all these social norms and learning about routine and following steps because i think following the recipe teach the child a child about organization the importance of time the importance of following um the recipe and orders and uh, trial and error at the same time uh, uh, and i can't stress how important we could uh, teach kids a lot of fine motor skills and a lot of other skills as well and even frustration and working on first their frustration tolerance within just the kitchen um, um, and learning about different recipes and at the same time adjusting with the new situation what i've been doing is because i have a lot of nephews and nieces we will have a zoom call and we will share all the trees that we learn and at the same time, I can't stress to the families as well, if you have internet is let your child be able to interact with his peers. If you monitor the Zoom and if you monitor their um, video call, I would highly recommend letting your child enjoy the social support. 
because as we enjoy the social support, I'm sure our mm -hmm. kids would love to see their kid, uh, their friends through, um, yeah, not only through audio call, but even through um, video calls. Mm. Well, and Isabel, of course, we want to uh, get to your research, which is sleeping hygiene, the schedule, but eating and pooping, and that's your baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so that's important. Thing, right? It's universal. <laughs> There's no getting around it if you're a human. And um, so, and Suzanne, if I could just point everyone also to the question that came up, it's in the chat box. So maybe the rest of you can be thinking about that while Isabel shares her research and we might end. It's a little bit different topic, but I think since we had a question, it might be nice to address <laughs> that too. So go ahead, Isabel. Talking about poop and talking about the kitchen at the same time doesn't seem quite appropriate, but um, <laughs> Suzanne, uh, war Suzanne warned me years ago. She says, that's quite a topic. You know, you will forever be known as Dr. Poop, and, and here I am. Um, it came about actually in a very uh, interesting way through the, my, my wonderful friend and call and you know, uh, gastroenterologist friend, uh, Dr. Eduardo Ramos, who was the one who, you know, who really encouraged me to look a little bit close, closer at these children because he was used to working with me for the feeding part. And, and he was saying, these kids are really peculiar. I think you should look at them. Mm -hmm. And we, we started seeing that many of these kids, um, you know, when you don't, when you don't poop, you're not well, <laughs> but when, when you have overreactivity and you are, you know, in, in a, you're, you're, you're in a high arousal state or high alertness state, you don't poop. <laughs> so you know, is it the uh, which way does it go? Um, and and this all of this basic uh, regulation of of sleep, as Sultan was uh, saying, or or pooping or eating, mm -hmm. I think is is key. And uh, many of our little kids now um, that were kind of on their way to, you know, getting over their pooping fears or or you know, getting away from their pooping rituals are having a pretty hard time right now um, with this pandemic and. For probably for many reasons because they're not getting the sensory input that they usually get which kind of keeps them on track and probably also because their anxiety level is up because of so many changes and, and uncertainty in their in their little world so yeah uh if i mean uh, ask about sleep ask about eating and ask about pooping <laughs> because a lot of those symptoms you know that look like over arousal or you know, might be asked, when was the last time you had a good poop? I'd be surprised how many families, you know, come up with horrendous numbers, like five yeah. days, 10 days. Especially so individual days, with ASD. Like Especially yeah. individual with so ASD, that, right? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. children with autism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think- you, And uh, we need the help. We definitely need to collaborate here with our gastroenterologist uh, friends because yeah. they, this is not something we can do on our own. Well, and we haven't exactly mentioned it, but I think that we have, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we have a collective assumption that for many of the children and families where they're struggling with these routines, they have sensory integration and praxis deficits. And, and so one of the unique contributions we have and, and why I love your work, Isabel, but also what everybody's doing is um, to, to put that overlay on it, that you, you do the analysis to get under, why is that child not doing the schedule like Rayanne said, or why are they not sleeping like Sultan said, or why are they not pooping? Why do they not wanna go sit on the toilet? Or why are they not eating or, you know, they don't want to put those clothes on like Katia was saying. So I think that that's one of our unique contributions from the sensory integration frame of reference for those things. And I just want to throw one more thing in it to, to not forget about um, is exercise. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when, when we're doing those activities with the children, you know, we're asking them to engage in sensory motor play. One of the things that I like to say is, okay, let's get away from the jargon, but you have to eat breakfast. You, you have to poop every day. You have to sleep every day and you have to exercise. 
which physical activity, because if not, if your child's so sedentary, they will, all of those other things are not going to go well either. Mm -hmm. So just. Even with spinal cord injuries, you know, um, they use the, the force of gravity because a lot of them would have some constipation issues. They use the source of gravity and they put them on a standing frame for a while just to help them with the constipation. So it's been approved by science that moving helps your bowel movement as well. You know, so um, having this uh, and talking about exercise and the importance of exercise, even for their mental status as well, it's really, really important. And talking about, talking about the new uh, situation or the new reality with COVID-19 is, even if you live in a small apartment, try to engage your child to participate in all these activity of daily living. One, it's safe, at least you are sure that your child is around you. And at the same time, you're learning from each other. You know, talking about conversation, let the child help you with a meal or with a different chores like loading, unloading, learning all these steps will teach them life skills throughout the day. Thank you, Isabel Tan. And Isabel, I wonder if you have like a three-step process or something when children aren't eating and pooping right. Do you, do you have any quick little tips for us? Well, the first, the first tip is um, the, the tube's got to be clean, right? <laughs> so if there is constipation, that has to be dealt with. It can be dealt with in many ways. It can be dealt with, with uh, you know, with, with food. It can be, well, but it's got to be dealt with. And not everybody will be will be solved the first thing. But you can't get into teaching a child a routine if he has some chronic constipation. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. That's the first step. And then pooping is the is the most important thing. I don't care if they do it in the tub, in the shower, on the floor, wherever, but it's pooping. And then thirdly, then we'll take care of the routine, the where, the how, the the you know, age appropriate, socially appropriate way. But that's usually my 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 three step uh, mm. program, you know. And wouldn't you agree um, uh, Isabel and I always say it. I had a webinar the other day uh, a month ago and I was talking about your roadmap to feeding competencies. And the first things I was saying to them is networking. As an occupational therapist, you have to network with a GI doctor and you have to network with speech and language pathologists, dietitians, and everything, because all this will help you to give you some background. Because as Isabel said, if you had some biological issues, it needs to be dealt through a GI doctor. And then you could help with this connection. Correct me if I'm wrong, right, Isabel, having like, knowing and having a good I totally I totally agree with you and I always I always remind people you know I, I'm an occupational therapist what do I do I do activity analysis that's what I do <laughs> so if you're not pooping you're not eating yeah. or you're not sleeping or whatever I will I will do my thing and I will analyze the different underlying factors that can be getting in the way and it might be sensory or it might be something else but whatever it is I have to you know, as you so well uh, explained yesterday in, in, in the web, yesterday's webinar, you have to use those tools mm -hmm. to get to those underlying factors in a very specific way. And then also sometimes you, you realize that it's outside of your field and you've got to refer, you know. So when, when they tell me, they come, sometimes families come to me and because they've heard that we're, you know, like the pooping experts in, <laughs> in the area and they tell me my kid hasn't had a good poop in 10 days, I'm like, go to the emergency room now. You know, I can't help you now. <laughs> go. <laughs> okay? Then we'll get back to how and when and, 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 and where, but not, I can't, I can't start working on a routine and start analyzing uh, and, and helping you with, with this situation, right? So obviously I have a, I'm very lucky to have an, an amazing network in, in Oviedo and where I live, where, um, a dietitian, a gastroenterologist, um, you know, the, the, whole, the whole kit and caboodle, everybody in their own space, but very, very much in a networking kind of uh, way we work together. You know, um, Isabel, I think your comment about activity analysis, this is a little bit of a different topic. So um, we only have a few minutes left. So if somebody wants to go back to that, we can quickly. But there was a question about helping children wear masks as a routine. 
during this situation. And I think your comment about activity analysis really addresses that. There's not going to be a one size fits all, even on the map. Um, and to, you know, to start with, we'll start with the analysis of what is it about wearing the mask that might be most difficult for that child uh, so that we don't just jump into, you know, tips that we use for everyone. But I think if you, you know, if you do that analysis and you find that maybe the child, you know, has some tactile reactivity issues and you think about the texture using a deeper touch pressure, maybe some spandex or something that will be a little bit tighter. Uh, if a child has poor perception, maybe they need to see the mask in a mirror, you know, some of the things to add visual, and maybe the rest of you have some ideas about that as well, since that was a question. I think you have touched the really important things, Zoe. I was about to say when I read that, is to know if the child, some kids would have tactile defensiveness and you have all this mask is tightly covering their face and their ears. And I have to tell you, I worked in a hospital for three days, uh, three years when I first started as an OT. And one of the worst things I hated all of this, to put that medical one, the smell, I cannot stand the smell. Mm -hmm. So I could imagine some, um, some um, other uh, uh, kids will go through this, you know. Um, maybe many of you know that my mom has been going through uh, some medical, um, she's a amenodilosis survival and she has to wear the mask every time she goes out. And Zoe and I, we shared the flight to, in summer and I had to ask mom, is it because the flight is so, and we couldn't done an upgrade. So there was no way of social distancing. And you know, in within the Saudi culture, a lot of women do the coverage. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, we, I ha we have to come up with something that within that time, because we were going on a vacation and we're celebrating her third anniversary and fourth anniversary, I had to ask my mom to wear that. So I'm saying, the reason why I'm telling this is just, I use my activity analysis to see and always see the situation and how to analyze the risk of the situation. In terms of this as well, I always say to people, like what Zoe said, they just analyze how that is gonna fit within the child world. Using themes, using themes is always important for kids. If the kids love a theme, wearing different costume, that could be one. Um, let them, if they wanna do their own, um, their own uh, mask, that could be uh, an option. But I think providing them with different options and learning if the child can accept this new reality, having it really, really, really close to his uh, mouth and nose and using different themes, favorite themes could be uh, a way to start the, uh, this new habit and routine in our life. Sultan, I must say, I, we often look at the front of the mask and the other day I was actually thinking, I actually made a mask with spandex at the back. Yeah. Because I thought, we always think about the front, but you actually forget about these, and the reason I realized, because my husband wears hearing aids, not SI, but so you can't have the elastics mm -hmm. here. And then you can't have it close here. So actually to make one that fits in, but you actually forget about, you often forget about the back of the mask. Because some of the children, the non-verbal children can't explain what's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And we think logically, and I, I totally agree. I think the front is most the cause. But we actually forget. But, so I was actually thinking, if you have deep pressure at the back here, it might just, have a bit more calming influence. Yeah, like the, the Saudi, some of the Saudi women who cover their face and have the mm. veil, it won't be a spandex. It would be more like, uh, it's more like a textile and it's not super, mm. super tight, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, for, for example, this is very an herb, very related to the culture, the Saudi culture. Maybe some kids when I have something similar, but what I've been recommending, even I had the family of mine, uh, a client of mine, who I call now a family from the US, and she's been asking me because California has um, enforced uh, wearing masks in public, right? Most of the city, uh, County of LA, County of West Hollywood, uh, and I think Burbank as well. And I said to her, and she's like, he does not want to put the mask on, medical one and everything. And I, we had to come up with different ideas. And sometimes I was like, if he doesn't mind even putting the shirt a little bit, if he allowed the shirt and putting just the shirt a little bit up like that, that could do um, the job for a little bit until he gets used to the new 
routine, a new reality that people has to wear masks. It's going to take them a while. Well, we've reached at the end of our hour. It's gone oh. really quickly. I feel like I could spend a lot more time with all of you, each of you. And I love this topic, honestly. Um, so anyway, thank you guys for joining us. And, you know, somebody Thank had asked about, we, we don't have time for this, but someone had asked about uh, those of you who, who have transitioned to other countries and how you did that professionally. So if you have any tips for, for our group, maybe you can just type them in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, before you go off so but thank you all so much it's just so much fun to see everybody and and, and you know we do have a traditional cheers we can cheers with our tea or our healthy orange <laughs> <I'll have> one. <laughs> or wine o'clock where you live cheers to everyone and water o'clock Suzanne what's what's on um next week next week oh I'm very excited about next week oh. next week we're going to have our friends from the UK Kath Smith and Roz Irwin and they do sensory integration with adults routinely. They're, this is something they've re done research and, and practice on. And I've invited um, friends of mine, a, a, a therapist who's working with Center Point for Children uh, with adults and her daughter, Emma, who's a college student, just absolutely lovely. And she's nonverbal with autism and she communicates through technology and so we uh, we have a lovely group and, it, and it'll be on supporting adults with sensory integration next week and it's also going to be at 10 o'clock in the morning because yes. we can't we can't have right there, we can do it. <laughs> middle of the night i know marco you've been a trooper <laughs> thank you marco thank you i know the yeah. only thing i i just i can't talk at all i i need to be muted all the time because I have this knee that's <laughs> running, you know, <laughs> jumping on yeah. my lap and I need to go off cams. And, but it's lovely. And I know that people uh, appreciate this time. So thank you. Thank you so much for, right. for thank this. You, and for this okay, thanks, everyone. And stay, stay thank safe, you. stay safe, stay positive, so stay work. connected. I remember. Oh, okay. <laughs> bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye. Besos.